Good afternoon. Welcome to Let's Talk TCI Real Estate. So last week on Let's Talk TCI Real Estate, it was the first episode of season three, and we discussed the loan slash mortgage process on a step-by-step -step basis. Today, I am delighted to have with me Mistress Wynema Sanders Penn, the Executive Director of the Turks and Caicos National Trust. We will be discussing the role of the National Trust and also ways that you can get involved with the preservation of our national heritage in the Turks and Caicos Islands. So the question may be asked, what does the National Trust have to do with real estate in the Turks and Caicos? Well, it has a lot to do with it. Tourists are attracted to historical and culturally rich cities, and I believe that the Turks and Caicos Islands has a lot to offer in terms of history and culture. The promotion of historical sites can attract new people, businesses, and investment into one's country. More prospective homeowners and business investors seeking properties and more people feeling that they are getting more for their dollar investment will have the effect of pushing values up. Also, the proximity to historical sites can also bring an increase in value to a business. Simply put, customers are always asking, what does the other islands have to offer? I believe that our rich culture and heritage is paramount in the success of real estate in these islands. Furthermore, as a resident of the island, it is important to know that our it is important for us to know what our country has to offer. And we need to know where we where we came from and what we can do to protect our national heritage. So without any further delay, please like, share this page. I am having a conversation with the National Trust this blessed Thursday afternoon. I am going to ask Mistress Wainima Sanders to please introduce yourself and tell us about your role with the National Trust. Um, well, good evening, Bernika. Thank you so much for allowing uh, me to be a part of your show today to provide information um, about the Turks and Caicos National Trust. Um, again, my name is Wynema Sanders Penn. I am the Executive Director for the Turks and Caicos National Trust. And we do quite a bit here um, to promote the safeguarding of our historical, cultural, and natural heritage. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you on. So I do have a number of questions I would like to ask you and I am excited about having this conversation with you. So as we start, I will ask you just to explain, um, you know, and clear details for us, what is actually the function of the National Trust? Let us know if it's a government statutory body, explain what kind of organization that it is. Yes. So the Turks and Caicos National Trust, we consider ourselves to be quasi-government. We do sit as a statutory body, but we are also membership-based, hence why we are consider ourselves to be a quasi-government. Now, the Turks and Caicos National Trust was established August 2nd, 1992. So this year, 2022, the Turks and Caicos National Trust is going to be 30 years old. Congrats. So we have a lot of amazing activities planned to showcase all the works that the National Trust um, has done for the country of the Turks and Caicos Islands over the 30 years um, of being established here in the TCI. Um, a lot of our focus again deals with the historical cultural and natural heritage of the Turks and Caicos Islands and we identify various sites that we um, deemed significant. Um, also, um, we investigate the sites, um, we do archiving and classifying as well, and we also promote the preservation of our wildlife um, and ensuring that people know the importance of taking care of the environment and being amazing stewards of the environment, and then educating public awareness. Education is a big thing for the National Trust, educating the public about um, how they, again, can be better stewards of the environment, how they can support with history and culture, um, and how they can volunteer with the National Trust as well. And we work closely with the schools and the youth and the students um, with our clubs. Thank you. So can you tell me what are some of the historical sites within the Turks and Caicos Islands? Um, if you can break it down for us in terms of islands that will be um, very beneficial to us and also explain to us like what are the terms, the hours like with those historical sites. 
Of course. So the Turks and Caicos National Trust Heritage Sites, um, hours are Monday through Saturday and by reservation on Sundays. Uh, we're usually open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, and you can contact the uh, National Trust office um, and we'll be able to provide you with the telephone numbers or you can go onto the site to get information about the historical sites and how you can contact someone to book or reserve a tour um, as well. And I'll start with uh, Providencialis. Um, here we have Cheshire Hall Plantation. Sorry, can I ask you one question? Yes. Before you were talking about the, the hours of operations, nine to three. Yes. Is there any specific reason why it's only nine to three and not longer hours? Um, we for usually do nine to three because we end up doing some maintenance and we're keeping uh, really vigilant of COVID as well. So we have to do our opening service, um, getting ready for the day, and then our afternoon service, which is getting, you know, closed and, um, you know, everything just shut away and making sure everything is secure. And that's why those hours are still. But again, we do do reservations. So if persons want to reserve outside of those hours, that's completely fine. We are very flexible and adaptable for um, tour operators or individuals who, you know, may have a, a really crunch schedule and may have only a certain time to come visit the site. Okay. Yes. yes. So go ahead and let me know what are the national okay. historic sites. Yes. So um, here in Providencialese, we have Cheshire Hall Plantation. Uh, we have our Bird Rock Point, and Cheshire Hall Plantation is one of our historical cultural sites. Mm -hmm. um, there are natural heritage components at Cheshire Hall Plantation as well. Uh, we also have uh, Bird Rock Point, which is an amazing trail um, in the Long Bay area. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely encourage persons to go and, you know, walk the trail. It's quite lovely in the early morning or right before dusk. You know, you'll see lovely wildlife, various reptiles and birds, um, insects. So it's a great opportunity, you know, just to reconnect with nature. And it's always um, great because it definitely helps to promote health and wellness you know, going out, doing your hike, and, you know, just taking care of your mind, body, and soul. So Bird Rock Point is a lovely area. Um, also, we have Little Water Key, also known as Iguana Island. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. That's where our endemic um, rock iguanas are located. We have amazing projects over there going on that will help with the sustainability and the lifespan of our uh, endemic rock iguanas here in the TCI. So, um, and then moving over to North Caicos, we have Wade's Green Plantation, another historical and cultural site. Beautiful, beautiful uh, heritage site um, in North Caicos um, for those to visit, whether you are a resident or a visitor. Um, it's just an amazing place to, you know, connect with your history and your culture. Uh, in addition to that, we have Flamingo Pond, a flamingo uh, pond facility basically overlooks the pond. You can see amazing flamingos during certain times of the year, uh, October, November. So those are times you'll see a lot of the birds uh, migrating in and out. Uh, so you'll see like thousands of flamingos, which is a really lovely sight. Um, for, especially for bird enthusiasts. There's a lot of bird enthusiasts throughout the world and even here in Turks and Caicos. Um, so again, it's an opportunity, you know, just to go visit the side and just enjoy being a part of nature. Um, in Middle Caicos, we have our Conk Bar Caves. Mm -hmm. Our cave system is beautiful. Um, we have a variety of bats <laughs> that are there, our, our, our wildlife. Um, we also have uh, crustaceans and isopods, uh, little um, marine organisms, because some parts of the cave are dry areas, other parts of the cave um, are wet areas. Um, and then there's also, you know, a great uh, pre-Columbian uh, component in regards to history there with the Lucayan natives um, that would utilize the caves as protection, as mm -hmm. shelter as well. Um, we also have, our boiling hole area um, in South Caicos. Uh, the boiling hole, again, is a natural occurrence. Um, it's really beautiful. It's kind of small. I think persons think of something quite grand, like the big um, uh, glaciers and things that 
uh, Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon, but it's like our little you know, boiling hole, which is special to us. Um, mm -hmm. But still, it's a great place to go visit and relax. You know, there's a lovely gazebo there, and you can also do some bird watching because it oversees the the pond area, the salt ponds. So you can see a lot of uh, various species of birds there. Um, and we also have the government house, the government house in Salt Key. The government house in Salt Key, again, is really lovely. It's quite, you can um, take some pictures beside it. Um, we're looking forward to a lovely uh, uh, in, uh, heritage enhancement project that will happen at the government house um, as well with some local partners and our supporters. So those are our heritage sites um, that we have available to the public to visit at this time. Okay, um, I've been to a number of those sites. I actually was in South Vegas just about two weeks, two, three weeks ago, and I did visit the boiling hole. Um, so it was a really good experience. And yes, there is a number of wildlife. I saw pink flamingos and other birds that it was very good just to be there. It was a little bit difficult getting to it, but yes, I was determined to, to do it. And yes. it, it was more so, but I'll tell you the truth, when I did it, it was um, it was a really good feeling. There's a lot of things you learn in school through um, mm -hmm. Um, just the, the the school books, you know, and your teachers telling you about it, but for you to actually experience it for yourself, it's like you're being a part of that history. It's not just enough to read about it, but also to experience it. And I'm sure we can count the number of persons probably who have or have not been there because when they see <laughs> how to get there. But so yeah, that, that's, um, I've been there and it, it was really good just knowing it. Um, knowing and having the opportunity to um, go there. So I will ask you, how actually are these national heritage sites determined? What, 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 what makes us to decide that these are national heritage sites? Mm -hmm. So our national heritage sites um, are deemed significant by the cultural, historical, and natural value that it provides to the country mm -hmm. um, overall. And uh, this can be done through uh, community members or persons who feel like certain buildings or structures or natural areas um, have certain cultural or historical value or natural value, um, of course. Um, and in that regard, um, then we would put forth either a, a building uh, preservation order or a plant preservation order that's through the physical planning process to safeguard those particular areas. Um, as uh, again, one of the mandates of the National Trust is to identify these areas um, and to try to classify them the best way possible. Um, a lot of times in regards to classifying these areas, what you'll do is, um, I don't know if you're aware of the World UNESCO Heritage Site. Okay. Um, website, um, they have uh, about eight or nine criteria that can also be utilized within your country to deem your uh, heritage sites like, significant on different category levels. Um, and the National Trust actually did that uh, in the previous year. We went in and we sat down, a, a team of us, and we went in and we went to each of the areas, whether it was a natural area, whether it was culturally significant or historically significant, and we went through those criteria. And a lot of the sites um, here in the Turks and Caicos Islands was between met between seven and eight of the criteria, which is very a very high number. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times, um, developers specifically look at these heritage sites, these rural heritage sites, um, and local heritage sites, and say like, hey, well. We want to do this development here, but it looks like it's by this natural significant area. Let's like change location or let's see if there would be a better suitable location for this particular project. And not only does that help uh, with the development because the developer is being more aware and mindful of where they're developing, but it also helps um, to safeguard what's going on in the country in regards to uh, safeguarding certain areas, certain sites, certain buildings um, from being destroyed. So that, that is why it's so important that we, we understand um, how this is determined, how these heritage sites are determined and the significance of them. Because all sites that we think are significant and all buildings that we think are significant um, possibly aren't as significant as, they, as we deem them to be, right? Okay. Um, Cause it's, it's at each individual will feel like a certain building or a certain site is more important than others. 
Um, but as a collective, we have to then use those criteria that are made available to us to then determine if it's so. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's good to know um, that the existing historical sites isn't the end all and the be all because yeah, there, it's possible yes. that there may be additional mm -hmm. historic sites based on the criteria that you, um, that you guys have to use as a guideline. So if I may ask you, um, we've heard about a lot of these historical sites that you have mentioned, like the Wade's Green Plantation, um, you know, Cheshire Hole Plantation. Um, mm -hmm. If I would ask, it doesn't have to be all just one or two. Can you just give us a little bit of history so we can understand a little bit more about the sites? Right, of course, yes, and I have highlighted a, a couple, and it doesn't, it's not going to be long at all, um, but one really um, lovely site that I, I really love um, is the Government House in Salt Key, um, and the Government House um, was known as either the Old Commissioner's House or the government, the government's guest house, and um, again, this was just utilized as a seating area for government um, and for the district commissioner's home. So um, usually they would also utilize the, the, the location to host uh, little tea parties or weddings. I believe the last wedding that was conducted at the government house was in 1976. So there hasn't been uh, much activity or events held there since then. So hopefully moving towards kind of going back to that same style of, you know, being able to host little tea parties and weddings and gatherings there um, at the government house in Salt Key. Um, another amazing uh, heritage site, obviously Conk Bar Caves. A lot of times we look at Conk Bar Caves as more of a uh, uh, natural environmental significant site, which it very much so is with the, the bat life in there with the crustaceans and the isopods and the microorganisms that are living in the wet area. Mm -hmm. um, so, but also it did have a, again, like I mentioned before, a, a historical component to it because the Lucayan natives lived and utilized the area as well. If you go inside um, the, the caves, you can see some of the um, old scripts that they would use or the pictures um, on the cave walls, as well as during the colonial times, you'll see names written on some of the rock crevices um, of what colonial persons or what sailors were there, what people were there, what ships came um, during that period, which is really, oh, it's so lovely. It's really splendid. Um, also, uh, Wade's Green Plantation. So Wade's Green, um, <clears throat> came here after the, the American Revolution. This is when the loyalists were told to disperse and go back to the UK. And mm -hmm. there were some properties and some lands, uh, crown lands that was available for them to use. And Turks and Caicos was one of them. And um, it was actually known first as Belfield. So the, it was founded as Belfield and then they changed it to Wade's Green um, Plantation. But this is where you would see a lot of the it was like a productive plantation town. You'd have sub plantations um, with it. Mr. Stubbs would have been the lead. Um, and then his family would have lived um, on the plantation. His, his uh, workers would have lived on the plantation, his staff um, as well. So Wade's Green Plantation is, a, is, again, is a lovely, lovely, lovely site. It does have the original structures still there at the plantation that persons can go visit. Um, as well. And then Bird Rock Point. Bird Rock Point in Providentialis, Long Bay area. Again, lovely area for hiking. Um, and a lot of times you'll see more of the environmental components here at Bird Rock Point. We have a lovely terrain area where you go from the dwarf forest to the wetland to the coastline. And you see the rocky, one of the last iron coast mm -hmm. um, in the world, really, and untouched. So we have to be mindful of that. Like if we have some of those last little untouched areas, you know, we have to prize that because that's really special because other countries cannot promote that and cannot say that they have those areas. So that's something really special here in TCI. Cool. Do you think that some of the wildlife that is um, at these, um, like you said, like Bird Rock Point or even Flamingo Pond, do you feel like they are, um, 
I mean, as many as used to be, or are they, um, you know, just trying to get an idea? Because I know I've visited Flamingo Pond, and I know it goes in season as well, but sometimes you hear mm -hmm. people said, not many flamingos like they used to know are in the ponds. What, what's your take on that? Um, again, it's very seasonal. Uh, when you come to migratory bird season, um, birds only come during certain times. So September to November, you'll see a, a good bit of bird life at Flamingo Pond. And then you have to take under consideration uh, the various environmental changes that have, have gone on after Hurricane Irma and Maria. You know, things have changed, so the environment has changed. So you may end up not seeing a certain species of birds that you would normally see at certain times, but then you'd see new species of birds um, coming in that you haven't seen ever before in your life. And those are the opportunities that you have to then uh, mark those and put that into the data, um, you know, which is really great because, again, you can share that with the with the international community. And then again, that drives for uh, ecotourism for people to come here and say, well, I can only see this, this species of bird here during this time, so I'm gonna come right now. The same thing um, in South Creek and North Creek and Grand Tark. Um, you see certain species of birds during that time that you wouldn't see in other times. Um, and you'd have to just be mindful of it as well. Sometimes people come and they're like, oh my goodness, we see all these birds here right where a bunch of people are, you know, it's the town Salina. So you're gonna see plenty of birds. You're gonna see um, a diverse set of birds at that. And it's right there in front of your face. So it's really nice to promote it like that, but then always being mindful that with environmental changes, you may see some changes. Um, it's a good thing you said North Creek and Grand Turk. When you were talking about some of the sites, I didn't hear you mention it, but mm -hmm. um, there is a, if I remember, there is a National Trust sign in the North Creek area for bird watching. Right. So um, we have the, the well, we, we help to manage, let's put that, okay. we help to manage um, the bird drive trails areas and we help to promote that. And we're actually doing more of it um, now. Before it wasn't as active, but now we're trying to get a little bit more active. And, and um, Renika, some of these sites, they're not underneath our heritage register. However, we still support with public awareness and educating the public about these sites. Um, these are particular sites that we would like to be put under our heritage register for safeguarding for present and future generations. So North Creek, South Creek is one of those. And we've been doing a lot of work at Wheeland Pond. The Wheeland community in Provo has been amazing with um, the wetland restoration works that we've been doing and able to provide the data and information um, to our partners, our international partners. So yes, uh, some of those areas, though we are promoting them, we don't have quite the, the management of them quite yet. Uh, so uh, I want to ask, <laughs> so um, why is it not under your management then? So um, right now, the reason why is because you, there's a process, right? Uh, we have to put it forth to cabinet or to the governor as outlined in our ordinance that we want to manage these sites. We see that these sites are significant. Um, I said earlier that it's important for us as the National Trust to identify and classify the sites. Mm -hmm. So now we have identified that this site is significant. It's very important to the environment, to our research, uh, to the scientific world as well, providing that data, and then also to tourism. So we can provide more diverse revenue sources for tour operators um, and persons to, to take their guests out and new services and products. So these are one of the sites that we're promoting um, to be a part of our heritage register um, so we can better safeguard them. And do you feel hopeful that this will happen, you know, when I say soon, but I mean eventually happen? Yes, uh, we're very hopeful that this will happen. Again, we've been doing a lot of work with the communities. Um, we see that the communities are very appreciative of the work that mm -hmm. we're doing um, and showcasing um, as well the, the significant of these the significant sorry of these areas. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, um, we're very hopeful. That's good. You know, I'm just talking about North Creek and just when I was in Grand Turk and I just happened. Of course, I'm a real estate, so I'm always mm -hmm. exploring, trying to figure out where's this parcel, what's going on. And I was in North Creek and I actually saw it and I, you know, started, I mean, venturing out a bit. And I was like, mm -hmm. there is a lot of wildlife and bird life activity that is happening in North Creek. And it's a very beautiful area. And some of these areas, um, it's like a lot of people don't know about them. Um, and I guess some people don't take time to explore them, but that's why I was asking because they're not a part of your site, so it may not be listed on your website or anything like that, you know, so that people can be more aware of these additional things that the island will have to offer. 
So with that said, I will ask you, are there any um, historical sites that um, is under your care, but not, um, not open to the public? Because you spoke about all that are open to the public. I just want to know, are there any that are not open to the public? No, all of our sites are accessible to the public. There, that is a part of our public awareness and education component is that these sites are accessible. Um, they can provide information. Our, our team at the sites can provide you with accurate information about the sites. So all of our national heritage sites are available for the public to use. Cool. So in talking about awareness, um, what are some of the initiatives that the National Trust actually have in place or will be putting in place to increase awareness about our historical sites? Thank you. Yeah. So we're currently in a new strategic planning uh, year. So we, we just finished our strategic planning session. We have a strategic plan for 2021, 2025. Um, and one of those priority areas out of the six that we have is public awareness and communications and aware and, you know, just educating the public again. Uh, we have put together our uh, communications and marketing strategy, um, along with our partnership strategy with one of our international partners, which is very important to ensuring that we are in the right direction um, to promoting uh, information about the, the national heritage sites. Um, again, we want to ensure that the information we're providing to the public is accurate information. We want to ensure that the information is accessible, as accessible as possible. Now, we know that persons aren't really into too much reading. I think we were discussing that before. Um, so we do conduct presentations and due to COVID, our presentations we have made virtual. So we try to do our, our live series, we try to do virtual uh, lectures with the schools, whether it be secondary or primary or post-secondary schools. Uh, we work alongside with the youth center with clubs. Uh, we also have our Moringa Heritage and Discovery Club um, online right now where students in the secondary and primary schools can join. Um, and we're working with teachers to um, ensure that the students have the right reference resources. Uh, we're encouraging parents, if possible, and even teachers to have reference books or a reference library in their classes or at home. There's a lot of amazing literature that is coming out right now by Turks and Caicos Islanders that are soon going to be vintage mm -hmm. kind of things that is going to be so yep. important to have into your in your house, you know, in a way of teaching your, your children and your grandchildren. So we're promoting that um, as well. So there's a lot of avenues and mechanisms that we're trying to use to get the information about the importance of safeguarding our culture, our history, our natural heritage uh, to the public overall. Okay. So what would you say is the most visited historical site in the Turks and Caicos? <laughs> um, you know, it's so funny because a lot of people would think that it's Little Water Key or Kung Bar Caves, right? But <laughs> Over the past uh, six months, six or seven months, Chashar Hall Plantation has been leading in the most visited in the most visited site, um, and uh, it's very interesting because you wouldn't like it's 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 a beautiful location, um, but a lot of people like wildlife, like bats and 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 reptiles, um, the iguanas when they come over. You know, sometimes the tour operators promote it as like the the dinosaurs. You're going to see some dinosaurs, right, <laughs> at, at Little Water Key. Um, but a lot of persons have really been enjoying uh, the tours at Cheshire Hall and the engagement from the staff. I have an amazing staff. They're very knowledgeable. Um, they're always reading, they're always learning. And we even promote internal capacity development when it comes to um, gaining more knowledge, whether it be in history, culture, or the environment. So um, that's you know really important to make sure, again, like I'm saying that the, the information is accurate and you're creating those memorable moments. So Chashara Hall has been creating those memorable moments. Oh. Is it because you've been promoting it a little bit more? Because I know I've seen a number of um, not advertisements, but advertisements out there about different functions you've been having at the Cheshire Hall plantation of recent. Do you think yeah. that's the cause? Um, or? Yeah, you know, marketing and promotion is really important when it comes to our sites. Um, we definitely push to promote and market our sites all equally um, as well. A lot of times um, persons at the end of the day going um, to 
the airport would be like, oh, well, let me stop by the site really quickly. I haven't seen anything and Cheshire Hall Plantation is right there. Sometimes it's location, it's about, is it accessible for that family? You know, am I gonna have to take a ferry over? Am I gonna have to take a plane? So you think about it in that terms as well. But again, you know, Cheshire Hall has been leading right now. We, all, we, we definitely put forth effort to promote all of our sites equally across the board. It's very important. And then again, with our communications and marketing strategy, all of our sites should be going up, up, up. up. Definitely. <laughs> so uh, earlier you spoke about maintenance of site. It's always good to have these sites, but you have to also maintain it. What do you do to maintain these sites? Um, give us an idea of what you do. Yeah, a lot of effort goes into the maintenance of our sites, whether it be ensuring that the facilities are impeccable and, you know, making sure that the bathrooms are usable, um, making sure that the outlets, you know, have amazing uh, merchandise in it for revenue uh, generating um, and also landscaping. You know, you really, you really don't realize how much money landscaping is or how much funding landscaping is until you have to do it. Um, but we have to do it, especially with our sites um, that have a lot of vegetation, um, our sites in North Caicos, uh, Wayne's Green Plantation, Conk Bar Caves. Um, it, it, a lot of landscaping goes into, into those areas. Um, and then just ensuring that the, the, the ruins or the structures that are there um, are properly um, safeguarded um, that no one's disturbing them, not even the vegetation sometimes. So uh, annually for the National Trust, we could spend about 45,000 plus dollars in maintenance. And that's not even as much maintenance as the, the locations need, right? So that's why we always um, ask for support when it comes to our corporate sponsors as well for those areas, you know, adopt a site mm -hmm. so that we can make sure that that site keeps going on. And it's always a plus um, for corporate sponsors and partners um, to donate because they're, they're contributing to, to the country, you know, and we're able to showcase that and put up plaques um, with their contribution or, or the name of the corporate sponsor that is contributing. So, I mean, it's good thing you mentioned corporate sponsors. So then if you are, if you would like to sponsor, I guess you will contact yourself as the director and then you will tell them in the best way in which they can make a contribution to preserving the heritage. Right, actually um, corporate sponsors, even if you're just at the site, you can visit and give your interest. You can stop by our office in Salt Mills, um, Unit 50 and provide your information. You can go online. We have social media. We have our website as well, um, the Turks and Caicos National Trust website that you can go and visit. And you know, just our, our email addresses are right there. So even if you can't reach me, we have amazing managers that you can get in touch with too to show your interest in becoming a corporate sponsor. Okay, so of course, someone may say this is a cheap question, Sam. I shouldn't be asking you that because, you know, people are always talking about the culture of the Turks and Caicos Island. Would you say then, based on all that you have said, that our culture is alive in the Turks and Caicos and we have a lot to offer? Yeah, I would definitely say our culture is alive in the TCI. I think that um, uh, how do we define culture? I think each individual person defines culture differently. Mm -hmm. I might define culture as a lifestyle. It's mm -hmm. what I do on Saturday morning with my family when I get up and go try to find some boiled fish and grits or some Johnny Cake and stew and, and uh, some Johnny Cake and, and Kong stew or some or some sauce in the morning, you know, because, you know, everyone likes to eat. But that's why that's for me, it's a lifestyle. I get up in the Saturday morning and do that. Or if the guys want to go out of the tree after a long day of fishing and sit down and, and talk and catch up on the what's going on during the week and how's everyone's family doing. It's a lifestyle. Um, I think a lot of times we dumb down our culture just to, um, you know, rum and music and dancing, but it's so much for, so much, sorry, so much more. more. Mm -hmm. It's the way we speak. It's our dialect. Um, it's what we consume. Um, it's how we dress. Um, it's so much, it's our artwork, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere in the world doesn't make scrap rugs, but here in Turks and Caicos, we make scrap rugs and they're quite beautiful. Um, and then to that being said, we do have subcultures. So each island has its own culture. So some things that a person does in South Caicos, they may not do in North Caicos. The same thing if a person's doing something in Grand Turk, well, that might not happen in Provo, you know? Um, during Christmas time, for example, it just happened, a perfect example, Christmas time. No one stays in Provo. Everyone wants to go to Grand Turk because- I stay in Provo. That's we have <laughs> 
<laughs> but I get what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. yeah every, and you have bazaar, you have um, the Boxing Day Fair, you know, you spend time with your family, you know, you're going to go out and have a great time. That's our tradition. That's what we do. That's our culture. That's our lifestyle. So it's it's not always something so grand as a big expo to show that you have culture. Sometimes it's just the smallest daily task that we do. You know, you sweep the front of your porch. You know, everyone sweeps the front of their house every day, every day. So it's just those small things that, you know, create the culture that is Turks and Caicos. So let me ask you from a real estate standpoint, can a heritage site be sold? No, a heritage site cannot be sold. <laughs> and let me give you an example. Would you sell the Taj Mahal? No. <laughs> right. Would you sell the Louvre? Would you no. sell the Louvre in France? No. No, you wouldn't. So that's the same way you have to think about heritage sites. Even though we're a small island state, this is still our culture. This is still our history. This is what makes our society so special, these areas where we can then go and showcase it to visitors coming here from around the world. So yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, we can't, we can't sell that. That's it's you can't even value some of these areas because of the historical or the cultural significance or the environmental significance of these sites. Yeah. Well, definitely I agree with you. You know, I was just asking. I have to I ask. <laughs> I love the question. I was excited. I, I, was I like, have yeah. to ask. In real estate, I mean, some people come and they feel like they can buy anything. So I have to make sure that our sites are protected and it cannot just be sold to anyone, you know, right. so just have to make sure of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So we're winding down um, to the last minutes of our show, um, you know, but it's just really get good catching up on you know the historic sites and what's going on in Turks and Caicos Islands. And I would ask you, is there anything that we haven't spoken about today that you feel like it's very important for persons to know about, about the historic sites or anything um, about the National Trust that um, we should know and be alert about? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I would like to tell everyone, please become a member. Let me, let me try to persuade you all. Please become a member of the Turks and Caicos National Trust. This is such an, an amazing organization to be a part of. I started off as an intern with the Turks and Caicos National Trust in 2011. And I love this organization so much that over the years, I've learned more and more so that I could become the executive director for the organization here. Um, and just becoming a member will allow you to, you know, gain access to the sites, um, be a part of various projects and programs, even opportunities to be an ambassador for the National Trust to showcase it in other countries and other mm -hmm. regions of the world. Um, also for, for junior members, um, it's important for you to better understand um, your heritage, your culture, um, your history, the environment. And that's a great way to do so by being a part of the Turks and Caicos National Trust. Uh, we have a online platform that you can go and join um, our website, www.nationaltrust.tc. You can go right on there. It gives you the categories, whether you're an individual, uh, family, or corporate member, a uh, proposed corporate member. Um, and you can go there and get, you know, a wealth of information, you know, go onto our social media as well. And we have, we're always sharing information and also become a volunteer. Um, uh, Vernika and I were just talking about the, the skill sets that we need that are not really tangible here in TCI, archaeologists, anthropologists, um, archivists, um, preservationists. Um, uh, microbiologists, you know, a lot of biology, a lot of sciencey things happen within the National Trust as well as historical. Um, so it's really important to have persons who are interested in those fields that can come in um, and help and contribute to the works that we're doing here um, at the National Trust. Well, that's good. I um, mean, you seem excited as a director, yes. which you <laughs> I, should be. I love it. I love what I do. My mother always says, um, when you're doing something, do it like you're doing it unto God and make sure that whatever you're doing, you're passionate about it because some days may not always be good, but the passion for what you're doing will always be there. And I just want to exude that so other persons can be just as passionate as I am about our culture, our history, and our natural heritage as well. Right. Oh, and I would like to say <laughs> one more thing because Go we ahead. did have uh, World Wetlands Day, February 2nd, World Wetlands Day was celebrated. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be hosting uh, two with DCR, the Department of Environmental and Coastal Resources, two cleanups on Saturday, February 5th. Um, the first one will be at 7 a.m. 
Wheeland Pond area in Wheeland, please come out, um, put on your outdoor clothes. We have gloves, we have a uh, pl plastic bag so that you could put the trash in um, and come and join us. And we also have another cleanup going on um, in Grand Talk. And that's gonna be at 6 a.m. West Road Pond area, West Road Grand Talk. And please go out and help and enjoy, you know, and just be a part of the community, you know, just always be a part of the community. Yeah, well, I mean, you guys have seemed to be doing a good job. I was gonna say, keep Thank up you. the good work. Um, you, so you know much. what, our heritage is very important to us. It's, we, we, cannot, um, we cannot say it enough that we all need to continue to preserve our heritage um, so mm -hmm. we can know where we came from, where we are now, and you know, just as a reminder. So um, I'm so delighted to have you on the show today. Thank you for taking the opportunity to accept the invitation. Um, and um, you know what, all the best in your endeavors and I look forward to volunteering with the National Trust soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's being a, a part of it. Thank you. <laughs> So I just wanna to say to all those who are listening today, thank you so much for listening as usual. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put it in the comment section at any time. If you have a question for the National Trust, of course, um, the information was given and I'll also put um, Ms. Um, Wynemer's, sorry, email and contact um, in the comments as well, just so you can have it for ease of reference. And I will say to you until next time, as usual, stay safe and remain blessed. Have a great night. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Wainema. Thank you. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this show belong solely to Let's Talk TCI Real Estate and not that of Keller Williams TCI or any of its affiliates. Any action you take upon the information provided on this show is strictly at your own risk. And Let's Talk TCI real estate guest or host will not be liable for any losses and damages in connection with the use of the material. I am not an investment advisor, broker, or dealer.